2057. The worldwide energy crisis is worsening. On an international space station, scientists are racing to create a more efficient solar panel. This is one of the last scheduled visits a technician will take to repair the space station. In three weeks, it will be shut down. Hello, Paula. How are you today? Fine. How about a little bit more air conditioning? Sorry, we're conserving energy. Great. What's our travel time? Two hours, 23 minutes. Get ready for takeoff. Ready when you are. Three, two, one. In the fairy tale Jack and the Beanstalk, a young boy climbs a beanstalk into the sky and reaches the clouds. Now the 21st century version of this is called the space elevator. And oh yeah, it is physically possible. Now amazing developments in nanotechnology may mean that in 50 years, a Sunday picnic in outer space may not be a fantasy. Dreaming the impossible is not new in the New Mexico desert. This is Los Alamos, birthplace of the atomic bomb. Now, physicist Brad Edwards dreams of riding an elevator into space. I started on a space elevator about seven, eight years ago when I saw a statement saying it couldn't be done. And for a physicist working on advanced concepts, that's red flag to a bull kind of thing. Edwards, a former designer of Los Alamos satellites, wants to make space travel cheap and safe. Rockets right now are exciting because there's danger, there's flame. We don't want that. We want it to be boring. So you get on, you're not thinking about whether you're going to die. You're thinking about, I'm going to go to space. I'm going to get there. When I get there, I'm going to do this. That's what we want. The idea of a space elevator is not new, but Edwards is the first to work out a practical design. A ribbon will extend 62,000 miles into space. A counterweight at the end will keep it taut through centrifugal force. An elevator car will climb 250 miles to a space station. By 2057, the trip could take just half an hour. It sounds crazy, but Edwards is already working out the nuts and bolts. He plans to anchor the ribbon on a former oil rig platform in the ocean. To minimize weather hazards, he's analyzed lightning data and found a quiet spot in the Pacific with few thunderstorms or hurricanes. And to lift the space elevator, a ground-based laser will beam high-intensity light at solar panels on the elevator car. Many challenges remain. What about orbital debris damaging the ribbon? Or radiation harming us in flight? Edwards believes that current technology can solve every problem except one. We need to make the high strength materials. Uh, we need to make those into a ribbon. Right now, um, steel's not strong enough. Kevlar's not strong enough. No material that we have is strong enough other than the carbon nanotubes. Los Alamos scientist Yun Tian Ju may have a solution. He's working with a remarkable new material that could be used for the space elevator's cable. It is 10 times lighter and 100 times stronger than steel. It's called a carbon nanotube. On a molecular level, it looks like a tubular honeycomb. It's made from the same material as coal and diamonds. The surface of this piece of carbon contains nanotubes. To see them, he uses a powerful scanning electron microscope. It took him just an hour to fabricate a nanotube. But it is so thin that to prove he had done it, 
took 12 hours and 230 photographs. Enlarged 50,000 times to the width of a hair, an image of a nanotube less than two inches long eventually circled the room. Now the challenge is to find a way to transform these tiny fragments into workable fibers. If researchers succeed, a carbon nanotube space ribbon may finally make space travel routine, opening the way for the construction of research labs, hotels, offices, and even entire colonies. Edwards believes that in less than 50 years, tens of thousands of travelers will be riding a space elevator. It'll be tourists, it'll be more general public, in addition to workers, people going up for business, uh, scientists going up for studies. It's a very realistic scenario. A world based on energy-hungry technology needs fuel sources beyond oil. How about a man-made sun or ice from the bottom of the sea? Two weeks before shutdown, solar panel experiments aboard the space station take an unexpected turn. What happened? I'm not sure. It seems to be acting up again. The computer is fine. I just checked it yesterday. Then why did it spike? I'll scan the drives again. I'll be right back. Hello, Dr. Wang. Secretary Luo. What can I do for you, sir? Our base station informs me you had pretty impressive results. Actually, me? sir, it's a false alarm. We're checking the equipment. Dr. Wang, when you do get a breakthrough, I want the data first. But that would be a breach of space law. And besides, Dr. Dr. Sanders... Dr. Wang, you're an officer of the Chinese army, and you will do as your orders. Due to the worldwide energy crisis, the United States and China have entered a third round of emergency talks on Central Asian gas and oil supplies. The European Union will mediate. Experts speculate the U.S. may be forced to tap into its strategic reserves. After the last oil crisis, the United States needed an energy insurance policy. So it created the Strategic Oil Reserve, consisting of hundreds of millions of barrels of oil, enough to run the entire country for 60 days. Great. But what happens when the world's usable oil supply completely runs out sometime in the next 50 years? What then? That's why researchers are focusing on solar power. Other researchers go farther. They want to create their own sun. Sunlight starts with a bang. When two hydrogen atoms collide, they fuse to create a helium atom and release intense energy. The process is called nuclear fusion. If we could recreate that reaction, we'd never have to drill for another barrel of oil. But creating fusion is not easy. The difficulty of reproducing fusion on Earth is like trying to light wet matches. It's a very complicated task. But we've made real progress in the last couple of decades. 